Hey all, welcome again. Um, I'm having the opportunity here, a huge privilege to chat with someone whose work I've been aware of for probably about seven or eight years, uh, Maha Bali, who is uh, a professor uh, at, uh, out of Egypt. She does some fantastic work in connecting with people online. Uh, she really models what I think exhibits a modern day faculty member who pursues academic work while simultaneously being actively involved in engaging in a broader conversation. And she's also part of a group of individuals that readily come to mind for me when I think of people who really care about the experience of individuals, both teachers and students in the learning process, which is a key thing to focus on in teaching and learning with technology. Maha, thanks very much for joining us. Maybe if you could give a little bit of a background to the people who are viewing this. Many of them will be faculty members who are just getting into the online environment, but a quick intro to yourself and the kind of work that you do would be delightful. Yeah. Thank you, George. Thank you for having me. So um, I am an associate professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. So I've been a faculty developer since 2003, helping other faculty with their teaching, supporting them. Some of that involves technology and some of it doesn't, um, but they intersect obviously as well. Um, and I also teach a course on digital literacies right now uh, to undergraduate students. Um, and I am also the co-founder of, of an organization called Virtually Connecting. It's a grassroots movement to help folks who can't go to conferences attend virtually. Um, a lot of this work, uh, and I don't know if you want me to launch into this, a lot of this work is not so much about uh, which technologies to use and how to use them, but also about supporting people um, to do what they humanly want to do. Uh, and just when they can't do it in person, how would you do it when you can't? And how do you connect with people? I think at a time of social isolation, <laughs> it's really important to maintain human connections. Um, and so I'm just gonna say, one of the key things that come to my mind when we're sort of trying to think about um, how are we going to do something online is to think about what is our teaching philosophy? What are we trying to do? How do we want to connect with our students? And then think about how might we be able to do that online and how might we support ourselves as well as our students? And um, one, of the, one of the ideas we, we've written about is intentionally equitable hospitality. So being intentional about what you do thinking about equity to make sure that whatever it is you do will be able to reach every person that really needs to be reached and being hospitable about it, like being welcoming, not in the sense of everyone's welcome, everyone can do whatever they want, but in actually thinking about how would you modify your practice to be hospitable to other people within whatever it is you can do. And you raise a really critical point there is that the environment as people move online, especially for students and also for teachers and in different institutions, the resources available, say, to a faculty member that is at an R1 institution, such as at University of Michigan or University of Wisconsin or even Harvard or Stanford, compared to the experience that might be available to someone at a smaller college in Canada or a smaller college in Britain or in Egypt or in South Africa, it's, it's not an equitable environment. We often talk about equity of access, but the reality is there are dynamics that are at play that don't enable that for everyone. And one of the things I've always been impressed with, uh, the, the emphasis that you have on equity in your work, and, and you mentioned the, the work that you've done with the VC uh, project, where you bring together people who for whatever reason, maybe couldn't attend due to time or couldn't attend due to resources, are able to participate in conferences from people who are actually at the conferences. So you're, you have a lot of experience at bridging that identity or space gap that comes from someone who is at an event for someone who isn't. Anything there from those experiences that you think, you know, this is something if you're new to teaching online, just getting started online, this is something that you might be able to bring in that you found really helps build community and build a sense of, of connectedness to others. Um, so several things. One of them is, um, first of all, the importance of checking in with the people you're trying to reach and what kind of resources they have. So thinking about, for example, do all your students have have access to their own devices, they have access to high-speed internet. Uh, recently in Egypt, we had a sort of very heavy rain that gave people electricity problems and some internet problems. So you need to check in on what's the, what's the minimum you've got and the kind of people you wanna to reach to be able to do things. So for example, we're meeting here on Zoom and a lot of people like Zoom and it's lovely and it works really well on low bandwidth. Um, but if someone has three people in the house trying to use it at the same time, that's not going to work on Egyptian Wi-Fi. I don't know if it works in other countries, uh, for example. So knowing that 
uh, thinking about that, thinking about, well, maybe I shouldn't schedule as much here, or if I'm going to have to schedule it and some people won't be able to make it, can I do it in smaller groups? Can I do it, um, can I at least record it so that if someone can't attend, they can watch it? And so thinking about those things. The other thing that I think the very most important thing about virtually connecting is that people get to see the videos that we make. They don't realize the amount of work that goes into something before you go into a synchronous conversation. And the important thing is the asynchronous part. So the not real time, not video part, the text that we keep with each other to build community over a larger period of time that enables people to just stay in touch and, and get to know each other and know what each other needs before you go to, the, to that moment that might be like a one hour or a half hour conversation. So with, with, I think with students, keeping in mind also that we need to, as faculty, take care of our own well-being and our own families and not be 24 seven available for our students, but to maintain some sort of channel of communication between them and each other and with us when they need it. Um, to be able to, to ask questions and, and, and even sometimes make jokes and, and go on off, off on tangents. And we don't have to be constantly checking those spaces, but just to be there when, when they need us. And when we can be, really makes a huge difference. So I use um, Slack because it allows me to have both a synchronous, it's a semi-synchronous space. If I'm there, we'll all respond to each other in Slack chat, and if I'm not, people can come in later and see it, and you can organize it so people don't get overwhelmed. But then for some people, students are already on WhatsApp, they already have groups like that with each other, and you know, some faculty will be willing to join those and some won't, and that's okay. Uh, sometimes, you know, there, there are little things that are very low tech that sometimes help people, like voice notes on WhatsApp, more personal, Kind of feedback if you're willing to share your phone number that helps um, but then for other people that's not going to be what they want to do and that's also fine i think it's really important to, um, to to not overwhelm ourselves and just to do what will help your teaching philosophy the, the most important thing for me that i'm trying to just sort of help people with who teach some cell classes is to remind them that just because we're telling you synchronous video conferencing might be problematic, doesn't mean that you have to resort to lecturing. That's the sort of the problem that happens is they think, oh, either I meet them at the same time or I'm recording a lecture and I don't record lectures, online learning sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, no, but you already know that you can do other things online. You're all on social media. You know that you do other things. It's just a matter of which of those other things are you willing to do uh, with your students rather than with your friends and how much within the learning management system would achieve that. And if it doesn't achieve that, forgive yourself for going out of the learning management system. This is a time of crisis. <laughs> and so it, it's okay to, to sort of do something you wouldn't normally do just because it helps you meet your teaching philosophy. Don't, don't, don't lose sight of that. Uh, fantastic points, uh, Maha. I think in particular what I uh, like about the emphasis there is that perfection is not necessarily the intention here. For many people, this could be a brief, though we're unclear how long that brief is. It could be three months, it could be six months or more, but it's a brief foray into, into teaching with technology. It doesn't have to be perfect. It, it has to be what you're comfortable with. If you're finding yourself stressed with too many tools to master, too many activities to try and wrap your head around, if you're uncomfortable with things like sharing personal information through to access to WhatsApp, there's a range of other options that, that people can use in teaching. A key thing that I've liked with your work for a long time is you do a nice blend of synchronous and asynchronous. And for people who aren't familiar with the definition, best way to look at it is synchronous is real time. Sort of you're, you're interacting in a Skype call or, or a FaceTime call that's happening at the same time with one, two or more people. Asynchronous is what happens when there's a gap in time. So I may have posted something and you'll come by six hours later and reply to it or comment on it or build something from it. You've done a fantastic job with exactly that. On the one hand with VC and virtually connecting and other things, you, you've built a community, even though as you noted, there's a lot of work that happens behind it. But you're also quite active in using a number of platforms, notably uh, social media or Twitter that I at least follow you on. And then of course your blog as well to communicate. And I think you raise a really important point that it, you don't have to teach to help students learn. You don't have to record an hour worth of lecture, right? So do you want to talk a little bit about some of the other ways that aren't intentionally lecturing approaches to teaching and learning that you found to be effective to help your students learn? Right, right. Thank you for that. Um, so one of the things is 
I think annotation is one of the great things that students can do. So my students do it usually for assignments. So they read an article. And instead of reflecting on the article in a short reaction paper, um, and anyway, we want to come into class and discuss it, uh, I use the tool called Hypothesis for annotating articles. So they can pick out parts of the article. They put comments there. We can do it publicly or within a private group for the class. And they can respond to each other so that they're having a conversation around the reading and they're getting really deeply into particular aspects of the reading. And so, for example, I normally ask students to do that anyway in my class as an assignment, but I'm thinking, for example, if I'm going to have to go fully online, then we'll go a little bit deeper and making sure they, they all re respond and then they all respond to each other and then we build a conversation around that. And then they can reflect on the whole process itself afterwards. So it gives them a lot of time to engage with the reading instead of having to meet face to face and discuss it or meeting all together uh, synchronously like in a video conference to discuss it. They can just spend more time engaging with the reading. And the thing is, they might actually read it more deeply this way because they're not doing it in a rush of time for an assignment and they don't have to think on their feet in the middle of class. They might actually reflect more. They might actually get other resources and share them with other students. They might get YouTube links that are relevant to different things. So I actually have an article called An Affinity for Asynchronous Learning that I wrote more than five years ago. And it's arguing, you know, a lot of times people think of we're going to go do the self-paced thing as because, oh, unfortunately, we cannot do the synchronous. But actually, there's affordances for the, for the asynchronous that might allow deeper learning, that might actually not only be more equitable, but actually be more pedagogically useful. So, so that's one thing. Um, if we're going to be watching a video in class, instead of watching the sending them, just sending them the video to watch, we can also use a tool like Biologs, which allows you to, as a teacher, ask questions in the middle of it or ask students to pose questions in the middle of it. And again, they can respond to each other. I mean, one of the important things about this is that not to feel like the teacher has to respond to every single thing, but allow students, give them the agency, and the ownership to respond to each other and support each other. And, and by not always answering quickly yourself, you're actually helping them build that uh, sense of sort of interdependence. And I think it's important to also tell students that. So, because they might not have that expectation. You know, if they are used to a teacher-centric type of teaching, which, you know, if you're not teacher-centric anyway, they'll know you're not like that, but you sort of need to remind them that online is also the same thing. It's not gonna change, especially if other teachers are doing it in that way. So they need to understand that different people are going to be doing different things with them uh, once they go online. Um, and you know what kind of expectation they have in terms of community responsibility, I guess, to each other. So that's another thing. A third thing that I really like to do is just collaborative editing of slides or Google documents. So you can just pose questions and let people just respond to each other there. Um, and it's there, most young people now um, are quite familiar with this, but they, you know, they might not have sort of the etiquette of how do I do it without offending anyone by deleting what they've said. So you need to sort of discuss that kind of thing. So it's not just sort of, here's a Google Doc, you know how to edit it technically, but they might not have the digital literacies of how do I do it without offending anyone? How do I go about it without overwriting someone's work, even by mistake, which is usually not intentional. And one of the ways I do that is to put stuff into like a table with different rows so that different people take different rows so they don't have to overwrite each other's stuff by mistake. Uh, or if it's a Google slide, people would have different slides and then go back and comment and things like that. Um, and you can ask them to do it all within a, an hour of time. So they're sort of all there at the same time, but it's not taking up the kind of bandwidth that you have with video conferencing. And it still allows for that sort of brainstorming of being in the same space together. Um, the other really important thing, I think, is breaking people up into smaller groups to make it manageable. Like if you're in a large class and you want to do something, you break them up into groups of like three or four or five. Do the same thing online and it makes everything more manageable. It's slightly more work for you, but remember, that in a real class, you're not listening to every single group conversation 100% of the time. And online, it's also sort of okay to do that as long as you have a mechanism for them to report back to you and to the rest of the class in some summarized form. Great. Well, thanks very much for that. And I know you mentioned an article uh, and, and we will be posting and sharing some in addition to, to the short discussions we're having here. Once people have a bit of an introduction to your area of work and there's a broad set of uh, spaces where, where they can become more acquainted with some of the very practical, uh, ex you know, experience hardened work that you've developed and that you've been doing for, for, for many years. One of the things that resonates with me in your last comment is the real emphasis that 
it's about really focusing on what works well in this space and having realistic expectations of the transition. And what I mean with that is, you know you can't listen to every conversation in a classroom. Don't expect to listen to every conversation online. It's, it's not a fair expectation. Uh, but there's a lot of expectation shifts that also occur, which is online, it is a space that is naturally attuned to networking meaning to have students create and share and in some ways become a type of a co-teacher with you around areas that they've learned that they can teach others is a, is a really significant outcome as well. Final question, I know we're running a little bit longer than I was hoping, uh, but great resources you're sharing here. Is there anything you would say to teachers about just staying sane in this transition, keeping in mind many of them don't see it as a long-term transition. Uh, there is a lot of attention being paid to the fact that our students are disoriented, they're overwhelmed, they're dealing with challenging scenarios. Our teachers are as well. Would you, anything you would like to share that might help them be more sane and well, for lack of a better word, in that setting? Yeah. So um, one of the things one of the faculty here just told me recently was in psychology, there's a good enough parenting thing like try not to be the perfect parent. And I think good enough teaching is also one of those things. I think the other, the other thing that I think is really um, important is share with your students what you plan to do as expectations. But if you need to be flexible and revise that, do that. I think if you're flexible with your students, they will be more flexible with you as well. So if you're understanding of their circumstances, but you also tell them you're, you're a human being, you have a family, you have other responsibilities, and ask them to also be understanding of yours. So for example, my students know that I'm a faculty developer, I'm supporting other faculty, so I'm not only planning the course for them, I'm actually helping the whole university with that. And so what they do is they're more understanding with me, but they also give me feedback in general that helps me do my other job better. So, so let the students help you when they can. When you're not sure if something's gonna work for your students, instead of thinking on your own and just you know, mulling over it, why don't you ask them? Guys, do you think if we did this, it would be okay? Do you have other suggestions? So one of the faculty members was showing me an email with a student who told them, oh yeah, just give us voice notes on WhatsApp, that's a good idea. That was not one of the ideas that we would have suggested, but a student came up with it. Um, the other thing is I think, um, Try to set time aside where you're not going to be on a device and let people know that you won't be available. I call this social absence. So it's the first difference between social presence and social absence is that you're absent, but you're socially letting people know not to expect to find you at certain times. Um, I need to do that with my boss, but anyway. But definitely with, uh, with my students, they can know, you know, uh, between this and that time, I might not be checking messages. If it's something urgent, what do you have to do? Um, and I think one really important thing is just to get out and open the window at least, even if you can't get out of the house, depending on what kind of situation you're in. Just get, breathe some air, I think. Really makes a difference, even if it's just for taking breaks, you know. I'm not the best at this kind of thing, as you can tell. <laughs> the other thing is just really socially connected, so social absence, but also finding ways to, to sort of uh, find your people to support you. So this might, they might be people with you at work, they might be people somewhere else. I'm organizing for my child a virtual play date with her friends on video. She wants a Zoom call with like 10 friends at the same time. <laughs> but like find ways to do that. The conversation that you were referring to that was happening last week was just us needing to support each other. We didn't even, we didn't need ideas for how do you do a technology. We know how to do that. We just needed to be able to talk to each other and support each other and just say, yes, we feel you. Yes, we're doing the same thing. We're doing the same work. Great. Well, fantastic uh, comments and suggestions, and I certainly appreciate that experience-heavy practitioner uh, orientation, and, and uh, it will, we'll certainly find teachers who are just getting into it to realize that there are things that you can do in a very meaningful way that can help improve the quality of your teaching, but also the quality of your students' learning. And the, the partnering with students, one, one way to, I've always looked at sort of the internet, like when I write something on a piece of paper and I give it to students, it's somewhat permanent in its form. Everything, everything on the internet is provisional and everything is networked and developed. And what I mean is you share an idea with someone, someone comes along, improves it, makes it better and shares it forward. So it's a natural benefit of the online environment that I think for new teachers is terrific for them to begin experimenting with. Uh, but at the start, 
a key message that came through in your, your sharing here is just the level of personal comfort and doing very practical things, partnering with students, asking them what would work and treating much of the transition like a conversation rather than a soliloquy to get started in this space. So uh, thanks very much for sharing your deep expertise. Much appreciated.